So, so far, guys, we've been looking at how animals know about their environment and how do they ensure they end up in the right place. Today, what we're going to start doing is looking at not only how they get in the right place, but how do they know when to get there. To start off, we're going to need to look at why is time so important to animals? And since all the animals that we're learning about live on Earth, we need to learn a little bit about the Earth's natural cycles before we start anything else. So as you know, Earth's a planet of our solar system and it orbits the sun every 365 and a quarter days. And if you're wondering about the quarter days, well, every four years, obviously you've got a full day. So those four quarters make up the extra day we get for a leap year. So when Earth completes one orbit of the sun, we know that that's a year. And during that year, as you well know, in most parts of the Earth, we have seasons. So the climate changes, it gets warmer or cooler. Now the reason for these changes in climate when it gets warmer or cooler isn't because it's getting closer or further away from the sun, but because it's on a tilt, as it moves around the sun, sometimes the northern hemisphere might be tilted towards the sun and the southern hemisphere might be tilted away from the sun, or vice versa. And this is what gives us summer and winter. And then halfway in between those phases, we've got spring and autumn. So over the course of 365 and a quarter days, we've gone through each of the four seasons. And you can see straight away that there's obviously going to be some quite big changes in the climate that an animal living out there might need to be aware of. Of course, as you're already aware, as well as the Earth orbiting the sun, it's also revolving on its own axis, spinning around once each day, every 24 hours. So as it's spinning around, half of the Earth is in daylight and half of the Earth is in darkness. And again, over the course of 24 hours, an environment for an animal is going to change quite a lot. Okay, let's just review what we've looked at so far. So a few of the Earth's cycles involve the seasons, the year, and the day. All of these involve time and things changing over time. So that's going to be really important to any animal that's living anywhere on Earth. Whether it's active in the day, active at night, breeding in the spring, or whatever else. Now on a clear evening, you'll look up into the sky and you'll see the moon. And you'll know that the moon plays a really important role into things that happen on Earth. In terms of space, the moon's really close to the Earth, probably about 400,000 kilometers away. But even when something's that far away, the moon's so big that it can still exert quite a strong gravitational force. The moon's gravitational force has quite a big effect on the seas more than anything else, which is ultimately the cause of the tides. When the moon is close to a particular point on the Earth's surface, the water in the oceans is pulled up towards it. This gives us a high tide. Because as we've already said, the Earth is revolving on its axis once every 24 hours, the point of the Earth's surface that's closest to the moon changes during the course of the day. Over a 24 hour period, you get around two tidal cycles, or just short of that. That means you get one high water, or high tide, every 12 hours, and at one low water around every 12 hours too. As you can imagine, if you're an animal living on a beach, your environment's gonna change quite a lot over the course of 12 hours. When the tide goes out, things are gonna get a little bit dry, and when the tide comes in, obviously things are gonna get a little bit more wet. For an animal living on a rocky shore, changes to the environment like these are gonna dictate what time you feed, what time you rest, and so on. So again, the Earth's cycles are really important to the timing of our animals that live on the Earth. The moon's also orbiting the Earth about once every 27 days. As the moon goes around the Earth, sometimes it lines up with the sun. So the sun and the moon are both in the same direction in relation to the Earth, almost like the three bodies in a line. Sun, moon, Earth. When this happens, the gravity from the sun and the moon are both in the same direction, so the pull is extra strong because the pull of the sun's gravity is combined with the pull of the moon's gravity. When this happens, we have an extra high tide, which we call a spring tide. You also get a spring tide when the moon's the opposite side of the Earth to the sun. So we've got sun, Earth, moon. When that happens, you've got two big lumps of water either side of the Earth, which again gives you another spring tide. Although this tide isn't quite as high as when the moon and the sun are both pulling the water in the same direction. So over one lunar cycle, about every 27 days, we'd expect to have two spring tides. Once again, over the course of these 27 days, if the height of the tide is changing every day, the environment's changing, and that's gonna dictate the way that our animals need to live. So that's about it for what we need to look at in terms of Earth cycles. Have a quick think about these questions. Maybe pause the podcast for a second, and then we'll go through the answers just to see if you've picked everything up you need to. 
So how long are the following cycles? A. An annular cycle. B. A daily cycle. C. A tidal cycle. D. A lunar cycle. Now for each of these cycles, can you remember how the Earth changes during the course of each one? How does the Earth change during the course of a year, for example? OK, so here are the answers. The annular cycle is 365 and a quarter days. The daily cycle is 24 hours. The tidal cycle is about every 12 hours, 12.4 to be exact. And the lunar cycle is around every 27 days. Over the course of the year, we have the seasons where the climate will change. And yeah, I know some of you are already thinking about this. It doesn't change so much in the tropics, but everywhere else, south or north of the tropics, the climate's gonna change over the course of the year. Even in the tropics, we still have wet and dry seasons. Obviously, over the course of a day, 24 hours, we'd expect to see changes in terms of when it's light and when it's dark, or night and day. Changes during the tidal cycle are gonna be the height of the water, from low water to high water. So at part of the cycle, the tide goes right out, so the water get level goes really low. And other times the tide comes in and the water level becomes high, which covers the things on the shore. Finally, we've got the lunar cycle. And the main effect of the lunar cycle is the change of how high the high tide is and how high the low tide is. So at a spring tide, we've got an extra high tide and an extra low tide, where at other times of the lunar cycle, the tide's not quite so high or quite so low. Sometimes I'm sure you've been to the beach and noticed it's a particularly low tide or a particularly high tide. That's probably due to the lunar cycle. If you got any of those wrong, remember you can rewind me this time. So feel free, pause it, go back and have another check. So I'm hearing you scream. What has all this astronomy got to do with timing mechanisms and biology? Well, I'm hoping some of you are realising that timing mechanisms that are set out by animals are mostly synchronised with the way that the Earth changes, night and day, high tide or low tide, winter or summer, for example. In this next section, what I want to talk about, guys, is how animal rhythms are linked to Earth cycles. So now let's have a look at how scientists actually record information on biological rhythms of animals. The first thing a scientist needs to do is to monitor the activity of the animal when it becomes active and when it starts to rest. We also need to monitor how long does the animal stay at rest for and how long does it stay active for. They then record all this information on what they call an actogram. An actogram is just a way of presenting this type of data in a graphical format, so it's easy to interpret. Okay, so on your screens right now, you'll see that we have got an actogram. This is a graph showing periods of activity and periods of rest in a particular animal. You can actually do these for plants as well. Now, basically, if you watch where my mouse cursor goes, um, you'll sort of see what I'm talking about. The dark bands the just that we can see there, the dark areas, the shaded areas, are periods of activity, and the periods where there is no shading at all are periods of rest. So the first thing I can tell from looking at this actogram is I can tell the type of rhythm that's present. And I can do that just by looking for a period of activity and a period of rest. And for this particular animal, I can see um, here that we've pretty much got one period of activity and one period of rest in about a 24 hour period and that's the same regardless of which part of the graph we look whether we look at this first bit where we've got nice straight lines or we look down here we've still got one period of activity one period of rest with activity starting approximately 24 hours later so this is an example of a circadian rhythm if i for example sort a period of activity and a period of rest over a period of 12 hours then that would indicate that i've got a circadian rhythm and obviously different periods of activity and rest would relate to the other rhythms that um the other earth cycles that are actually present so that's basically the first bit of information i can take the second bit is i can actually work out a few other pieces of information here as well and I can look at whether this clock is endogenous or exogenous. So just to remember that endogenous is an inbuilt clock and exogenous is a clock that's actually um, worked on by the Zeitgebers. So it's influenced by Zeitgebers is what I should say there. So for example, if when sunrise happens, it actually tells the organism to actually wake up and sunset sort of indicates to the organism it's time to sort of rest. So um, what I can see here is I can see the first bars look very, very, very neat. Now that indicates to me that we've got Zeitgebers present and that this 
clock is being entrained by these light givers. So these light givers are telling this organism when it must be awake and when it's probably a good time to start resting. Okay, um, in this particular point here, I can see that the light givers are present now. At 22 weeks, or sorry, 22 days into this experiment, whatever this experiment was, what do you think's happened there? Just take a, a quick think and see if you can figure it out. Maybe pause me for a second. Okay, well, what has happened at 22 days there is that this organism, sorry, organism has been placed in constant conditions. So the zeitgebers, the change of the environment, have actually been removed. Now, by doing that, What's actually happened is this organism then is relying only on its inbuilt circadian clock to actually tell it when to go to sleep and when to wake up. So it's not only Zeitgeber's presence, so it's just using its circadian clock and it's actually going through a period of activity that we call its free running period. That's basically just the, the period that you would go through um, if you had no Zeitgeber's present at all. Now, I can actually tell from this actogram how long the free running period for this organism is because like we say, circadian means around a day, and different organisms have different lengths of free running periods. Now, let me show you how I'm going to do that. So, what I'm going to do is I've just just put this on on paint so I can make a few markers here. But if I just quickly go for 22 days, I'm going to make a mark as to when activity started on 22 days. I'm going to try and get my line as straight as possible there. Okay, and I can see that that is looking to me to be around sort of it's not quite six, so I'd say about five. AM there is the start of activity and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and follow to see how much later the activity gets now what I'm, I'm seeing here is because activity starts a little bit later every day I'm seeing that the inbuilt clock the um, the biological clock of this organism the free running period is a little bit longer than 24 hours because each day this animal sort of wakes up if you like a little bit earlier sorry a little bit later so I'm just looking here now, activity starting at 12, activity starting at midnight, and then back again, activity is now starting sort of on day 43-ish, activity is starting 24 hours later, okay? So I'm just going to quickly make a mark there as well, so it's 24 hours later, okay? I'm going to keep going on, and, and there is another sort of 24 hours there, so that's sort of, um, maybe a little bit of a crappy line there, let's just move this line to let's maybe even delete that one um, where have I got there? 5 o'clock so roughly around there get a straight line you'd obviously do this with your pencil and ruler if you were in a test or you are trying to work this out in class or with some data that you were given or you, you generated yourself maybe but I'm doing a little bit roughly but if we look here, about day 80, it would actually look to be, if I just actually maybe go from this point here, and then, it's not far off day 80. So what I'm doing really is I'm just um, finding the points at the graph where we can see a change. So we can see here that by day 42-ish, it looks like we're 24 hours later. Um, 24 hours later again by about sort of day 60-ish, or maybe 55-ish even. And then by, by the, toward the end of the experiment, about day 70, let's say day 79 there, by day 79 we are, so 24, 48, 72 hours later. Okay, so basically what I'm seeing here that over the course between 22 and 80 days, which if I if my math serves me correctly is um, 58 days. Okay, so by 58 days into the experiment, or 58 days after the um, the lights were turned out, or the, con the conditions became constant, we had a change in activity of 72 hours. Okay. So what I mean by that is activity starts 72 hours later, 58 days after the conditions became constant. So what I can tell with that is I can then use that information to actually calculate how long the free running period of the animal actually is. 
So I'm just going to work it out and I'm going to use just, just type this into words so you can see exactly what's actually going through my mind here. So we started off at day 22. So the start was day 22. I'm just write that in full. Okay. Um, and the end day 80. So basically using my calculator or using my head, I can see that there is 58 days difference between those two days okay over 58 days activity became 72 hours later okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to work out exactly how long the free running period is so I want to find out how much later activity became each day so I'm going to take the 72 hours which was the difference in the activity, you know, the difference in the start time of activity over the course of thing. And I'm going to divide that by 58 days. Um, and I'm just going to just bring up my calculator here. Because my maths isn't my best point, I must admit. I rely on my calculator as a tool. The shame of it. Okay, so if I just bring this up, 72. And I'm going to divide that by 58. Okay, so that gives me 1.24. So 1.24, let's say, hours. Now, as I said earlier on, if I just quickly bring the picture up again, as I said earlier on, because activity is becoming a little bit later each day, I can tell that this free running period is longer than 24 hours. And what I know now is this free running period is longer than 24 hours by one hour, 24 minutes, or 1.24 hours, so one and a quarter hours, okay? So I know that the free running period is equal whoops, to 24 hours plus 1.25 hours, let's round it up to 25, which equals 25 hours and 15 minutes. And it's 15 minutes because 0.25 is a quarter and it's a quarter of an hour. So 25 hours and 15 minutes, which basically tells me the free running period of this organism. So just going back to the picture there, what we're actually looking at, we've got an actogram. It gives us all kinds of information to summarize. We can see here that we can generate the idea that, yeah, with this being really, really perfect and then not being so perfect, this would indicate that this is constant conditions. Okay. After the conditions, uh, sorry, this isn't constant because, sorry, this isn't constant conditions. This is where there are Zeitgeber is present. But after this day 22, we can see that there are, there are constant conditions that are, are now in force. There is no Zeitgeber is present, no sunrise, no sunset, no alarm clocks. It's just down to the biological clock. And that's when things start to get a little bit later. Sometimes on these uh, actograms, the actual um, the activity is a little bit earlier each day. In that case, instead of it all going sort of off to the side this way to the right, it would actually go off to the left because activity would be starting slightly earlier each day. And that would be because the free running period is below 24 hours. So maybe say 23 hours. So that would mean that the activity starts an hour earlier each day. So I hope that's clear. It's probably necessary to watch that a few times and um, get a bit of a practice. Try and find some um, actograms. I will put some on the wiki space. Um, get the actograms, have a bit of a look at them. Try and work out the free running period. Try and work out if there's a period where there are constant conditions uh, and see what you can do with it. I hope that helps. Well, that's a bit of a beast of a podcast, isn't it? Lots of information there. Bit of a skill to learn, lots of new words. So you'll probably need to watch it a couple of times. Um, you'll maybe, if you're in my class, you will be doing lots of work on that in class two. Uh, like I said, the um, actogram stuff will be on the wiki space, and there's a link to the wiki space, or there will be soon on YouTube. Um, if you're not in my class again, you can watch the video as many times as you like, and you can post a message onto YouTube or the wiki space, and we'll see what we can do to help you. Uh, as always, guys, I hope the podcast finds you well. Take it easy and keep it real.